Welcome. Uh, we uh, we always enjoy our, our legislative briefings and looks like we have a tremendous turnout this morning. Uh, we will be handing out or it looks like we are handing out some uh, information that uh, may be helpful as we go through our discussion this morning about the uh, critical role that uh, higher education plays in Oklahoma's economy and frankly Oklahoma's future. Uh, I must say, well let me first things first, we uh, have a lot of events uh, uh, on this campus at OCCC. Uh, I was very privileged, as a number of others in this room were, to be here uh, a little over a month ago now for President Stewart's investiture. And uh, I think everyone would agree, he's off to a running start and certainly uh, uh, already providing significant leadership here. Let's thank President Stewart and the Regents and our staff at OCCC for hosting this event here today. And Derek, I think as we're here to uh, uh, talk about what uh, the role higher education plays in, in our economy and our future, uh, your, your comments were heartfelt, right on the mark, and uh, uh, best wishes to you in all of your endeavors. Uh, outstanding uh, and very, very significant to what we're going to talk about here today. We've got several campuses represented here today, and what I would, uh, again, I want to recognize uh, uh, certainly uh, Governor Fallon's Chief of Staff, Denise Northrup, who's here, and appreciate you making time to be here, Denise. Uh, our legislators, uh, as we recognize those, uh, those individuals, and as we're talking already about our budget request for this coming year, I do want to take a moment, uh, I think as everybody in the higher education community knows, we uh, last year, uh, at the end of session, with uh, work with uh, Governor Fallon, the Governor's Office, and our legislative uh, uh, colleagues, we were uh, able to reduce the uh, program cut for higher education from 5% down to 3.5% and also to receive funding for our debt service for our 2005 bond issue. So let's start by saying thank you appropriately for their leadership last year, everything they did to help us on the budget and to move that cut down and equated to about a, a $30 million swing in our, in our favor. So let's thank them for those efforts in 2015. <laughs> Certainly always good to be in a room with uh, Governor Nye. Governor Nye was governor when I started my service in the uh, legislature in 1982, and great that he's still uh, with us and uh, always uh, weighing in in a very positive way about the future of Oklahoma. We have several also from our state region staff who are here that certainly enjoy our legislative briefings. We, we uh, started this my first year as chancellor to frankly get around the state after our budget request has been submitted, not just to talk about our budget, but frankly to talk about uh, uh, the importance of higher education. Our staff enjoys having a chance to participate, so without introducing them individually, most of them are at the, uh, the table and back there. I'm not sure why. They may think they're strength in numbers, but uh, <laughs> let's recognize State Region staff who's here with us this morning. And as, as we talk about the budget request today, several presents are here that President Seward has already introduced, but uh, we do work collaboratively as a system. It is my pleasure to uh, work with our presidents uh, who, uh, who absolutely provide great leadership on our campuses. I'm going to start today by uh, there's so many happenings and so many critical events that are occurring on all of our campuses, but just mentioning a couple as we kick off today. Uh, University of Oklahoma is represented here today, and I think, as most of you know, uh, they now are in a position where they're number one among all institutions, both public and private, in the number of National Merit Scholars, uh, number one in the United States of America, over 800 enrolled currently as National Merit Scholars, so let's congratulate the University of Oklahoma on that great achievement. <laughs> Langs Langston University represented here today now has the largest freshman class in the history of the institution with this fall 2015 class. The final enrollment numbers for Langston uh, was 692 freshmen uh, compared to last year's number which also broke a record and this achievement was re recently featured in the uh, HBCU Digest, a national publication. Congratulations this morning to Langston University. Our, our Secretary of Education and Workforce, President Natalie Shirley, is here, 
and uh, on the campus of OSU Oklahoma City, a new initiative called the Classroom to Nurse Program, providing academic support to students that pursue a career in the nursing field, made, made possible by a grant from the Intelligent Community Initiative, uh, very, very important in terms of uh, meeting the needs and producing nurses for our workforce where there is a critical shortage. Congratulations to Secretary Shirley and OSU Oklahoma City on this achievement. On the campus here of OCCC, they have been designated as a National Center of Academic Excellence in the Cyber Defense Education Program by the National Security Agency and also by the Department of Homeland Security. This recognizes their ability to meet the increasing demands of program criteria that will serve our nation very well in contributing to the protection of our national information infrastructure. President Stewart, Regents, congratulations to OCCC on this achievement today. And finally, in August, I was on the uh, campus of Rose State College for when they dedicated their new resident hall, the Village, at Rose State with the completion of this facility. Uh, they now have a residence life for their students. And I think President Webb, I've already heard her say, but would agree this provides an additional opportunity for them to be engaged citizens in their community, certainly at the college. And uh, congratulations again on this achievement to President Webb, Rose State College today. As we start our discussion this morning, I think it's fair to say, and uh, uh, on behalf of President Stewart, let me introduce uh, Senator David Holt, who just walked into the room here. So let's welcome Senator Holt. And Senator Holt, I got your text a moment ago as well. So, all right. Okay, the, uh, what I was getting ready to say is, I think one thing is constant not only in higher education, but certainly as our state is uh, grappling with a very serious budget deficit we see nationally and even internationally. And that is that there's significant change going on really everywhere, certainly at the college and university level, but in our country, in our, in our, in our world environment. And the key is really how those that are involved adapt to the change. We have several options. Uh, certainly many are simply reacting and trying to deal with all the information. Others have game plans where they are aggressively uh, coming forward with ways to not only uh, deal with change but to thrive as change is occurring all around us. And I hope as we go through this discussion today, it'll be very clear that higher education is one of those that has a game plan as change is occurring in the environments and in the space that we're in. Well, I'd like to start with a discussion of our public agenda goals. Often it's, it's best to go back to the basics, if you will, and, and really discuss what higher education is about, what are our major missions, what are the goals that drive our decision making. And in higher education, we have three major goals. The first, no surprise for uh, anyone that's uh, been around the last few years because we talk about it all the time. Our first goal is to increase the number of college graduates. Everyone knows. Uh, the data, Governor Fallon has uh, announced our participation now a little over four years ago in Complete College America. All the states that have uh, more or a greater percentage of their citizens with college degrees and certificates are the states that have the higher per capita incomes and the stronger economy. So clearly, this is our number one priority in higher education. Our second priority is twofold. First is to enhance access to college. Uh, the state regents believe very strongly, as our institutions do, that if a student has the ability to achieve in college, maybe they were initially told that they didn't, but if they persevere, if they, through our admissions criteria, through our testing criteria, if they can demonstrate that they can achieve in college, we believe we have a responsibility to give them the access or the means to attend college, which we do through a variety of our financial aid and scholarship programs at every campus within our state system. And I've got some new information on what we've done in this area and in this, in this space later in the presentation. So we want to provide access to students who have demonstrated that they can achieve in college. At the same time, we have an ongoing responsibility to do everything that we can to ensure that the quality of our higher education product continues to be strong. We do this, I think, as we know, through a variety of accrediting 
uh, entities that we, uh, we deal with and that accredit our academic programs. Uh, it's fair to say this year that many of our institutions have not only met that base level, but have received additional accreditations which further enhance the value and the quality of the degrees that our students receive. And finally, as I've had a chance this weekend to uh, participate in UCO's commencement on Friday and two uh, at Southeastern Oklahoma State University on Saturday, uh, it's very clear that our faculty take their roles very seriously in this process. And our third priority is to make sure that our students are prepared when they graduate from our colleges and universities to meet the challenges of, again, what we know is a rapidly changing global economy. Our faculty give our students the tools to problem solve and to critically think and to analyze where they're going to be in a position and have the skills, the requisite skills to deal with those questions and to deal with the problems that come up not just this year or next year, but frankly as they go forward because they have those baseline skills that are necessary to do that. So this is our public agenda in higher education for this year. These three goals will drive our strategic decisions, our budget decisions, and our operational decisions as we go forward. Next, I'd like to talk about our legislative agenda. Uh, it essentially is centered around four major priorities. The first, uh, degree completion through Complete College America. Not just our top priority this year or next year, but uh, with Governor Fallon announcing this uh, in September of 2011, this will be our top priority for the next eight years, and quite frankly, I think it will be beyond because of the importance of this initiative. Our next major uh, legislative agenda item this year is weapons on campus and to maintain the current law with regard to weapons on, on college and university campuses. I think we should say that higher education does not oppose the Second Amendment or gun ownership, but we believe the current law is working. The current law, I think as many know, gives the college or university president, the, the opportunity to authorize the carrying of weapons if the president deems that the circumstances warrant it, the individual circumstances. Uh, this has happened uh, on our campuses. Uh, we had a question that came up in committee last year uh, over 17 times, about two-thirds of the time that it's been requested. Uh, so our position is that the law is working. And, and you look at that from a broader perspective, and we listen to our law enforcement community, and they tell us very strongly and, and, and very, very persuasively that essentially there's really no scenario where generally carrying weapons on campus do anything other than promote a more dangerous scenario for our faculty, for our staff, for our students, for our alumni and our visitors on our campuses. So we will continue our efforts to oppose weapons on campus. We believe that our current law is working and working very well and certainly appreciate the support uh, that we've uh, had in the legislature the last few years on this initiative. Our third major priority is Oklahoma's Promise. Think about it for a moment. The program started back in 1992 when, when I was in the legislature. It's now provided scholarship opportunities to over 65,000 students in this state. Again, students that have the have demonstrated they can achieve in college, they just don't have, don't have the financial means to attend college. This program currently provides scholarships to over 18,000 students, and it works. If you look at all the comparison points and compare the Oklahoma's Promise student to the general student population, the Oklahoma's Promise student has higher high school grade point averages, they have higher uh, ACT scores for college interests, they have higher freshman grade point averages, the persistence rate from the freshman year to the sophomore year in college for Oklahoma's Promise students is higher. They have higher graduation rates. Ultimately, probably the final outcome, that a higher percentage of Oklahoma's Promise students have jobs in this state one year after graduation than the general student population. So this, this program works very well. The scholarship works very well. Uh, we should thank our governor and our legislature for continuing to fund it. And certainly, again, as, you, as we look at initiatives that will drive uh, additional degree completion. This has got to be at the top of the list because these are students that are high performers and we certainly appreciate the past support and would, as we go forward into the 2016 session, uh, ask that we preserve this vitally important scholarship program for our students. Finally, our fourth request, no surprise, is our budget request, which uh, we'll talk about in greater detail in, uh, later in the presentation. Not to say that we don't have challenges ahead of us. We certainly do. 
Uh, we have data from multiple studies that indicates that uh, Oklahoma will experience a significant workforce gap in the near future. Governor Fallon's workforce report from the Office of Workforce Development shows that there is a skills gap and a workforce gap uh, both in the uh, certificate and associate degree as well as the bachelor degrees level and that we're going to need to produce significantly more uh, certificates, associate's degrees, and bachelor's degrees going forward if we're going to meet our workforce needs in the state. Similarly, the Georgetown study last year came out with a report that told us, told us a lot of things, but I'll just focus on two. And again, the clock on this is even, even tighter because this is in 2020, and if you think about it, we're almost in 2016. So essentially, we're talking about four years, 67% uh, of all the jobs in Oklahoma by 2020 will require some college, a long-term certificate, or a college degree. And by 2020, 37% of the jobs will require an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, or higher. So yes, we are feeling the pressure to meet uh, these workforce needs. Uh, it's on us. It's on us right now. And that's why our degree completion initiative is so very important. The governor recognized the importance of this skills gap and established the Oklahoma Works Initiative whose goal, again, getting it down to just the simplest terms that we can, is to align our educational efforts in the state more directly with business needs to address not only the current workforce needs, but future workforce needs. Uh, our state system of higher education has played a key role with the governor and her staff on this initiative. Uh, the governor, I think, as everybody knows, Governor Fallon's been barnstorming the state this fall, promoting the initiative. She's held nine regional key economic network meetings throughout the state. And to a meeting, they have been met with tremendous support from business and education leaders uh, in Oklahoma. Some new information that, again, I think documents the vital role that we play uh, in the, uh, in the e economy of Oklahoma. Uh, every year, we uh, work with our Employment Security Commission to match data. Uh, this information came out in mid-September, so as the slide says, it's still hot off the press, or at least maybe warm off the press. Uh, the data shows that 85% uh, of those that earn college degrees in our state one year after graduation, 85% of those graduates have jobs in the state of Oklahoma, which is very significant. Nine out of ten graduates have jobs in this state. Go back essentially three decades ago when we experienced the energy downturn in the early and mid 80s. This number was not 85 percent. I think anyone that was here will remember there was significant concern that our graduates were having to leave the state to seek jobs in other states, but certainly uh, the 85 percent number uh, is one that's, uh, that's much better. One of the reasons, there probably are several, but one of the reasons, again, going back to this alignment, uh, the last decade in higher education, we've made a much more concerted effort to link our academic programs much more directly with what business tells us their needs are. As I've listed a couple of areas here. There are others, but clearly in the healthcare and nursing area, this has occurred in engineering, business, aviation, and aerospace, in new academic programs like wind turbine technology, geospatial technologies, telecommunication, data science, and analytics. It makes sense if you do this. First of all, students will have internship opportunities while they're attending college, and ultimately they'll have permanent job opportunities when they graduate from college. The most recent data on the value of higher education, again, is very clear. A uh, study from the Bureau of Labor Statistics this last year confirms, and this is national data, but in, in our country, if you compare a college degree holder to a high school diploma holder, on an average, in this country, in a year, the individual with a college degree will earn over 22,000 a year more. If you take that and apply those numbers to an entire career lifetime, the individual with the college degree in comparison to their counterpart with a, a high school diploma will earn over $1.1 million more during their career lifetime. And as I mentioned earlier, that's certainly one of the benefits and it's important, but there are other benefits. The benefits of, of leaving and earning your degree and becoming an engaged citizen, going back to your community and serving in leadership roles there. All the data shows that those with degrees are the more engaged citizens in their communities. Taking us directly to Complete College America, we still have work to do here as well. Nationally, more than 30% of adults 25 years and older have a college degree compared to 
24.2% in Oklahoma. The good news is we acknowledge we've got work to do, but we have a game plan that we are executing that is already closing this gap in a very significant way. Probably this slide explains our dilemma better than anything else I could say. I'm often asked why all this focus, why all this attention on degree completion. I think this slide says it all. Over the last two decades, and if you're following, this is on page 12 in the uh, presentation. Over the last two decades, essentially the United States has slipped all the way from being first in the world in college degree production down to 16. So I think uh, the bottom line is this isn't where we want to be as a nation. It's certainly not where we plan to stay. And as a result, we uh, kicked off our participation with Governor Fallon on September 22nd of 2011 when she announced our participation in Complete College America. We had a boost that day because the leadership from Complete College America was on hand for the governor's announcement and they announced that of the 33 participating states that Oklahoma had been designated as having the model plan for degree completion. And essentially the Complete College America initiative is centered around one major goal and that goal is to give states the tools that they can need that they need and they can use to increase certificate and college degree production. I'm not going to talk a lot about our plan, uh, but I will say that, uh, again, the national leadership has said it's the best of the 34 states. And I would say the reason is it goes back to the basics. We were the first state to have cabinet officials and legislators on our executive team. Within three years, Complete College America made that a best practice where they require all states to do that now. Our five-point plan focusing on college readiness, it only makes sense if we don't prepare students in high school for college success, the chances are greatly diminished that they're going to be successful. We have the EPAS testing program that higher education funds, our gear up program which is designed specifically to give students in high school tools for college success. All of those initiatives, certainly the work that we're engaged in right now on the standards development, all of that uh, uh, certainly drives the initiative of college readiness. Transforming remediation through co-requisite courses in high school, uh, through not engaging in the blame game, but giving those students opportunities to uh, take their remedial courses for credit and then get on with the business of earning uh, the courses that count towards their degree. Pathways to degrees and certificate completion. Again, these co-requisite courses are very important there, as well as our strong relationship with Career Tech on our cooperative agreements where students can take courses uh, while they're in Career Tech. They can take courses for college credit. Rewarding performance, uh, where performance is based on uh, increasing retention rates and graduation rates. The Business Roundtable has recognized uh, Oklahoma's plan as one that certainly is the best practice. And finally, adult degree completion. If you think about it, this is really critical to our success. Success in higher ed degree completion. The numbers again show that the high school to college population is starting to level out. So we've got to look to adult students. We've got to look to uh, underrepresented populations if we're going to increase our numbers. And that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, the data shows that we have over 70,000 students in this state that have 72 hours or more towards their college degree, but they don't have their degree. And we've launched in my uh, third year, or excuse me, my third month in this role, we launched an initiative called Reach Hire. Now, all of our campuses in this room participate in Reach Hire. It's designed specifically to provide those students that in all likelihood, many of them are place bound with the, the customized degree through a, co a combination of traditional learning and online learning where they can earn their degree, they're more valuable to themselves, their families, and certainly also uh, to the state. So this has been a great, great initiative. And uh, I might also mention as far as Oklahoma's success in Complete College America, we've received a couple of uh, good bits of news in the last month. We were one of eight states selected to participate in the first cohort of the National Scaling Co-Requisite Initiative. And this, uh, again, gives students to uh, move through remedial courses and gateway courses quicker and more efficiently, which, again, allows them to complete their degree on time. We also were selected about three weeks ago to work with the Charles Dana Center at the University of Texas in Austin on a math uh, Pathways to Completion project, again, picked out among all the states that participate because 
of the profile that Oklahoma has in Complete College America and because of what we're doing with degree completion. So I think it's fair to say four years into this initiative, we are viewed by uh, the objective observers as being in the top rung of states in the nation in degree completion. Again, let's look at the numbers. We announced in 2011 we wanted to move over 12 years from the current number of degrees and certificates, 30,500, all the way to 50,900, a 67 percent increase in degree completion, a very ambitious program. Uh, the governor uh, announces our numbers every year. We've, we've been very transparent. Uh, we knew to do this, we would have to increase every year for 12 years certificates and degrees by over 1,700. Year one, we didn't meet the goal. We exceeded it by producing an additional 2,945 degrees. Year two, we didn't meet it. We doubled it with 3,577 additional certificates and degrees. And in September of this year at our Regents Education Program, Governor Fallon announced our success in year three with uh, 1,842 degrees. So again, uh, this is three years into a 12-year initiative. We met and exceeded our goals each of those three years. So hats off to our institutions, certainly to the governor and our legislature for their leadership. But we still have nine years to go, and we're very focused on meeting that goal each of those years. Next, I'd like to talk about our uh, getting into the budget, about our appropriations uh, over the last uh, essentially eight years. Probably the baseline uh, for everyone, not just for Oklahoma, is the, re the national recession which started in 2008. Essentially, you can see we bottomed out there in 2012 and we're now back on the road to uh, uh, larger appropriations. But if you just look at that slide, essentially since 2008, uh, the appropriation level for higher education as a system uh, has been reduced by $87.6 million. Uh, as everyone knows, that's complicated further by the fact that we've experienced enrollment increases uh, on nearly every campus since that time. So the budget's gone down, uh, enrollment numbers have gone up, and that creates more pressure uh, on our campuses. Uh, another way to look at this, uh, essentially a 35-year snapshot, is the percentage of the, high, of the state budget that's appropriate to higher education. You can see back in 1980 uh, that 18.6% of the budget went to higher education. Uh, that number now is 14.4. So it has experienced, uh, over the last 35 years, about a 4% decline. Uh, this is one of those cases where it is a zero-sum game. When you have areas that receive less, there are other areas that receive more, and that, that's just the way it works. Another way to look at the uh, uh, at the numbers would be in terms of looking at the higher education dollar and look at the, the percentage of the dollar that comes from state appropriations. You can see back in 1988, about three-fourths of the higher ed dollar came from state appropriations, almost 75 percent. That number now is down to 35 percent. A legitimate question, well, how, you know, what, what are the factors that have contributed to this? Uh, basically, no surprise, the dramatic increase in Medicaid and health care funding uh, has been the largest, but there's also been uh, increases in the Department of Human Services budget, the corrections budget, the transportation budget. As those areas have experienced more a part of the pie or the budget, uh, other areas like higher education and common ed have experienced a lesser percentage. Which brings us to this year. Um, we spent a lot of time, as everyone in government has since August, looking at the, uh, the, uh, what our budget requests will be for the year. Uh, everybody knows the numbers uh, are not particularly encouraging, uh, reflective of the decline in the uh, price of oil per barrel in the energy sector, which uh, has been hovering for a couple of months now, right around the $40 uh, per barrel level. Uh, our discussion is based on meetings that we've had with Secretary of Finance, Preston Dorflinger, with uh, Senator Clark Jolly, the Senate Appropriations Chair, and Representative Earl Sears, the House Appropriations Chair. Uh, basically, they've indicated, uh, and we've certainly seen the reports in the media, that the budget uh, deficit this year could be as high or as much as between 800 and 850 million and a billion dollars. So, with that in mind, we've developed our budget this year, certainly with that deficit front and center, and uh, we have made the decision that, in light of that, uh, we are uh, requesting from our governor and our legislature a flat budget this year with no uh, increase uh, because of the, in recognition of the fact that we 
uh, are going to experience a budget deficit uh, possibly close to a billion dollars. In talking with Secretary Dorflinger and, and Senator Jolly and, and Representative Sears, uh, they indicated that addendums for funding could be attached, and we asked if uh, documenting what our fixed cost needs would be, health care, retirement needs, workers' comp, uh, utilities, and other fixed costs, if that would be an appropriate area for an addendum. Uh, they indicated it would be because this is not a new money request. Uh, the fixed cost, of course, as everyone knows, if they're not funded, it will in, uh, only uh, increase the amount of the cut. So in conjunction with discussions with them, an addendum to represent the fixed costs of the system uh, of $22 million is also attached. What I'd like to do now is talk for a moment about how we, as a higher ed system, are coming forward to deal with this very significant budget deficit. The first step is uh, we've made it very clear that we're going to do everything we can uh, to maximize efficiencies and cost savings. And along those lines, and I presented this when we uh, made our budget recommendation with the state regions two weeks ago, and I've just included several examples here. There are many, many more, but I hope it's indicative of the seriousness uh, that we're as a system approaching this issue. We're looking at joint degree programs between institutions at Cameron University and Rogers University in elementary education, Southeastern and East Central and nursing, where one institution will provide the general education, the others, the more specialized courses, and obviously you save money when you come together for a joint degree. Some institutions have indicated they're going to reduce scholarships. Uh, at Seminole State College, several have embarked on early retirement initiatives at USAO, Southeastern, and Tulsa Community College. Sharing faculty between and among institutions, Cameron and Roger State, uh, have initiated this as well as Southeastern and East Central. If you think about it, again, in areas where there may be uh, lower enrollment coming together and sharing a faculty member, which obviously, of course, will save money. Uh, several institutions have indicated there will be reductions and elimination of athletic uh, facilities. Uh, two institutions are, are closing uh, their aquatic facilities. Uh, Redlands is eliminating both volleyball and their equine program. Every institution in the system has, uh, through Governor Fallon's energy saving program, we were on board early on that and are, are working on retrofit, uh, energy retrofit projects to save money. Oklahoma State University has taken a lead in this, uh, documenting savings uh, this year in excess of $5 million. Uh, there's been consolidation of administrative positions at Redlands Community College, Tulsa Community College, uh, prioritization of academic programs and restructuring those programs, uh, most notably at Northeastern State University, where, again, there is uh, uh, lower demand uh, in programs uh, are being phased out. Uh, with the emphasis going on the programs that have higher enrollment and higher demand. Combining campus sites occurring with Connor State College and the Muskogee campus where they're combining the Port campus with the West campus. Uh, consolidating health care coverage where institutions are going together and forming a consortium to uh, uh, achieve savings in that way. Another area that's been very significant is consolidation of back office functions, accounting, human resources, and payroll where uh, and this has been achieved by, primarily through governing boards where they've gone together and consolidated these functions. A number of institutions have come together on a risk management consortium to provide workers' comp insurance. Uh, Roger State University has announced a very creative initiative called the Virtual Desktop Computer, which essentially reduces the need to replace desktops. It lowers the, uh, uh, the installation uh, and also uh, the licensing fees required. Uh, there again, I mentioned uh, energy savings earlier, and Western Oklahoma State College has also embarked on initial, uh, an additional initiative there uh, in the area of energy conservation. These are just a few examples. There are many more, but I hope it uh, sends the signal that we're not just looking at this as a six-month project. We understand when I mentioned change at the outset, the business model in higher education is changing, and we are certainly. Uh, coming forward with ways that are very uh, creatively addressing those changes and, and I see these as long term not just as something we're going to be doing while we're experiencing this budget deficit. But obviously with the, the dollars going down and enrollment going up most states uh, have looked at tuition uh, to help alleviate some of the uh, the difficulties there. 
And this is an example of where I would say the national story and Oklahoma story is much different. Uh, you look at uh, in the media reports from California and Illinois, Georgia, Arizona with high double digit increases in tuition, not the case in Oklahoma. Over the last eight years, our average tuition and fee increase, as you can see from this slide, has been right at 4.5% or exactly at 4.5%. So uh, we have kept it below 5% under our process, which involves input from students, faculty, presidents, governing boards, and ultimately the state regents make that decision within the parameters that the legislature have established. One study from the U.S. Department of Education ranks the four-year institutions in Oklahoma as the third most affordable in the United States. If you look at that slide, uh, the red there, which is hard to read on the slide, but may be easier to read on your handout, a national average being 17,474, Oklahoma's number 13,005. I mentioned financial aid earlier, and this next slide really tells, I think, a very significant story. Even though the budgets have been reduced by $87 million over the last eight years, if you look at this slide, from 2000 till this year, there has been essentially a 6.2 increase in scholarships and financial aid. So we have reprogrammed our dollars and made financial aid and scholarships a top priority in Oklahoma higher education, certainly giving more students who have shown they can achieve in college the chance to attend college. Along those lines in affordability in 2014, the Southern Regional Education Board, which uh, is the group that we participate with along with 15 other states in the uh, uh, eastern and southeastern quadrant of the United States, uh, established a National Commission on Affordability. They asked me to chair it, quite frankly, because Oklahoma has such a great story to tell on affordability. They also asked Senator Jim Halligan and Representative Lee Denny to participate. Uh, our work is basically focused on best practices to leverage financial aid, taking into account federal aid, Pell Grants, tuition, and, and other opportunities. Uh, some of the data points that came out of the study, uh, which uh, we thought was interesting, one is everything being equal, states that have coordinating boards, uh, have lower costs of higher education and lower tuition costs, and certainly uh, coordinating boards are associated with providing a quality education at an affordable cost. Uh, the U.S. Chamber came out with a report earlier this year ranking the 50 states in terms of overall affordability, not just tuition fees, but housing and books, the related costs of going to college. They ranked Oklahoma higher education fifth in the nation in overall affordability, which certainly is a great achievement. Uh, STEM is uh, one of Governor Fallon's top priorities, and certainly uh, uh, she has had a very successful STEM summit now for three years running. According to the same U.S. Chamber report that I referenced, Oklahoma is now ranked 16th in the nation in job growth directly related to STEM. Higher education's done a good, a good job in this area, increasing the number of STEM students receiving degrees in STEM fields by 6,000 over the last five years, which results in a 28% increase in STEM degrees over the last five years. Student debt is another area where the national story is much different than the Oklahoma story nationally. And of course, I need to say this is based on uh, Ivy League institutions, East Coast institutions, and the numbers are staggering. Uh, the numbers in Oklahoma are different and qu quite frankly a lot better. Uh, three takeaways from the report that came out in November. The first, 45% of our graduates graduate with zero student debt. So half of our students leave our college universities with no student debt. The next takeaway is those that do have debt, the, the debt is 30% below the national average. And all that has resulted in a ranking of Oklahoma higher education as being seventh in the nation in terms of students leaving our college and universities with the least amount of student debt. You may have seen the article earlier in Forbes magazine where they ranked uh, the 50 states as far as uh, where are the best states for recent college graduates to locate. We were very pleased that Oklahoma was ranked second in the nation as far as best places for college grads to locate. The report cited consistently low tuition, good starting salaries and per capita income, and consistently low unemployment rates. Uh, OETA, our public television outlet in Oklahoma, conducted a survey uh, in February and asked the open-ended question of what is the most valued state service. We were pleased that the Oklahoma uh, National Guard and higher education tied to be 
uh, as the most valued state service in the state according to this survey that was conducted. Uh, University of Oklahoma, Dr. Bob Doffenbach at the Price School of Business uh, conducted a study to look at wealth generation over the last decade. The study told us that uh, essentially that the wealth generated in our nation over the last decade exceeded $1 trillion. The study also said that 93% of that wealth generated came from individuals with college degrees. So certainly the data is there as we go into this very difficult year. Uh, I would say we know we've got a lot of work to do. We understand that it's our responsibility to make this case. Uh, we believe, though, we can make a, a very, very persuasive case that in terms of wealth creation and job development, that higher education plays a critical role. Uh, the objective data shows that higher education generates, uh, quite frankly, a better return on investment than any other investment that the state makes. The Battelle report that was commissioned by the Business Roundtable and the State Chamber a couple of years ago told us that higher education represents a $9.2 billion economic impact in the state and that for every dollar that our governor or legislature appropriates to higher education, the study documents that at least $4.72 is returned directly back to Oklahoma's economy. We know our work is important work that opens doors for students and builds their career and changes their lives. Derek, we certainly, I think you made that case so well. And I think I would just say in closing that, uh, and I think this is our track record uh, with Governor Fallon, with our legislature, we want to be working partners with you uh, over uh, the next few months in the legislative session. We don't want to simply say uh, this is what we need or what we have to have, but we understand the difficulty of this dilemma. As, as President Stewart said, I've certainly been on, on that side, and, and so we do want to work and partner with you. Our goal, again, is very transparent. We hope that by making this case, we can work to minimize uh, the cut to higher education, to protect higher education, or hopefully to hold uh, higher education flat. Uh, we believe we've got the tools uh, to make that case, and we're ready to get to work. So I thank everyone for their attention today. Uh, wish everyone a happy holiday, and again, as I say, it's on our back to make the case, so I ask everyone here to join with us as we work with our governor and legislature over the next seven months. Thank you so much for being here today. <laughs>